Afternoon everyone, we're here with Michael Nichols um, and we are standing in what was his trial strips of maize. It's windy and miserable everywhere else but sunny here in Sisters Creek so um, here we are Michael. What have we got behind us? What has been harvested? What hasn't been harvested? Tell us a bit about your strips and what you've been doing. Right yeah, so we've got five varieties in this nine hectare paddock. Uh, the varieties are around the, the two hectares in size. We've harvested the asterisk, that was the first one to come off. Um, it did get a reg loan and a roundup just to try and get it to mature quicker or, or die off quicker. Um, so that's been harvested, uh, dried down. We end up with about 9.2 tonne to the hectare at 16%. Uh, we then moved on to the obelix, um, which also uh, surprisingly outdid the like dried down quicker than the 8500, um, which is meant to have a longer CRM, but it actually has a really quick dry down time. So that's been harvested and that, that did around 9.6 tonne to the hectare, um, which was getting better, but I was still hoping for a little bit more. Um, and then we've harvested the P8500, um, which that one didn't quite look as good as the as, uh, the Obelix, but it has actually out yielded all the two and that's that's come in at about 11 tonne to the hectare at 16% um, dry matter. 11 tonne, you'd be pretty happy with that. So how many different varieties did you try this year all together? So there's five varieties. So as you can see, the one behind us is a Pioneer 9125 and I think they've got a HSR, very small strip still to go. And that's another, uh, that's a 91 CRM as well. So we've got them two still to go, but we'll just wait till the weather comes right before we get them because the, the moisture has been the biggest issue we've had. Um, so the, the asterisks came off at about 32% moisture, the obelix was about 34%, and the P8500, which we really were quite pushing the boundaries, came in at 38% and that took a lot of drying. So it's alright if you've got a dryer in your backyard, but not everyone does. That's, that's right. So yeah. why grow maize? What have you been trying to achieve here? Uh, so there's a lot of demand um, for uh, dairy farmers, especially when they want lead feed, which is where the cow has given given birth and it's just coming into the milking season and they, they, they class it a lead feed but it's normally a high corn um, part of the diet to transition them on to wheat and what we're finding is uh, if we can transition them on at about a 20% corn blend in the wheat um, yeah we can we can sell corn really easily um, and, it's, and it's great for the cows. So do you like what it does for your soil here? How do you deal with the trash that's left over? Yeah, so you can sort of see it's there is a lot of trash left over. Um, we've harvested this year with a corn front and that's made a huge difference. Um, basically, the corn front processes the whole lot. Uh, you can sort of see the storm behind us. This is what the corn front leaves it at. It chops it off at this high. This is still quite a fairly woody part of the plant. So we then ran the mulcher over, which has knocked it down to this high. And you can sort of see all the organic matter. Last year we found that this can create a bit of a mat over the top of the ground and the ground underneath stays wet. So we've actually just run our, um, just a tine through it, a, a, basically just a, a tine with wings at about four to five inches deep, just to try and incorporate that and bust some of the, you know, to, to start getting the microbes working in the soil. Um, and this, because this will be going in with potatoes. So which variety are we standing in here? Uh, so this is the uh, P9127, I think it is. And this is dried down on its own? This is dried down on its own, but you can sort of still see the green stem. Um, it's taken a long time. It's a very tall variety, like the cobs are quite high on the plant. Uh, all the other varieties, are, they were good, probably foot lower than this. Um, and, and something that we are looking for in the, in the cob is when it dries down, we like it if the cob bends down because that sheds the water nicely. Uh, we also want a good sheath around the cob because uh, the Asterix had a very, quite a weak sheath. And you'd say this one has two because there's a couple of, um, you know, it's, it's sort of exposed, which means that it can um, get bugs or fungi in there and it stays, it stays wet. Um, Is it a problem if you get all that disease on the tip? Not, I'm not so concerned about the tip, it's more that we get fusarium starting in the middle of the cob mm. and that's something that we don't really want on there. Speaking of disease, what is the fungicide schedule for something like a maize crop? Do you have to spray it many times? Uh, no, the, the biggest issue we have is normally heliothus. Um, 
that's probably the biggest drama we have with the crop. Nearly every single plant, apart from this one, um, has had a heliosis in the top of it. And they pretty well just take out the very top section of the plant. How does that um, affect your yield? I don't know if it affects the yield, but it allows weather to get in there and, and it starts that fungal breakdown. Um, so I'm thinking that, you know, try, I, whether we have to go with insecticides or there's something else that we can do to prevent the heliopus coming in at a certain stage. Um, the other issue is actually trying to get over the crop to spray it can become quite an issue. Um, so I guess it's all, a, it's all a learning thing and we're just playing with varieties. Um, mm. Like I say, the, the, the Asterix, the Obelix and the P8500 were nowhere near as tall as this one. Yep. So I think that this is probably more a silage variety than it is actually a corn variety. So we've got a maize crop standing here. When did you have to plant it? Are you harvesting it at a date that you're happy with? And where is it going to fit into your rotation? Um, so we, we planted this the first week of November. Um, ideally, I think we could plant it uh, maybe 10 days earlier to try and get uh, more daylight on the on its growing time. Um, we're still playing with densities. We, we think we're on a 750 mil row here, um, which I was actually pretty happy with. Um, it's allowed good airflow in between and it's allowed it to dry down better on than on the 500 mil row spacings we've had the last two years. Um, and and we don't have to necessarily worry about the soil temperature as much. Um, after going to a maize day in uh, Echuca, uh, Fred Bellows, which was a, a maize expert from the US, came over and being so close to the ocean, which we're only about two or three k's here from the, from the sea, he said if you're within 10 kilometres of the sea you can't go off soil temperature because you've got the coastal breezes that'll keep it down anyway, but you will not get the hard frosts that'll kill it. So. The earlier we can put it in, the better. How quickly did it come up when you put it in in November? Uh, it was up within seven to ten days, and it and it basically uh, took off. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the other thing is, you know, weed control is quite good because there's a whole range of different chemistries that we can use on it. Um, so so weed control was was really quite quite acceptable. Um, Nutritional wise, we planted with a with a base fertilizer at about 350 kilos to the hectare of uh, 14, 16, 11, um, and then gave a few top dressings before it got too high. So practically speaking, how did you sow your corn in November? What machinery did you use? Um, so we used a, a contractor to come in and, and sow it, um, just a precision planter. Uh, because all the corn has to be spaced nicely up the rows, um, but you know it's. I, I, I think that it, it's worked quite well, really. Did you have any problems getting on it with the sprayer? Uh, yes, you can only really. Uh, by the time the heliotis scrubs come in, it's normally too tall to spray or too hard to get over the crop to spray. So yeah, this is, I guess that's something we're going to have to work on. And like uh, spraying the asterisk, that was quite easy because it was such a, it was a much shorter crop. How much shorter was the asterisk than this variety? Uh, I'd say take another two foot off it. Right. And it was, it was a lot shorter. Yep. Yeah. So a lot more manageable. So where would you want to see maize going into your rotation? What would you want for or after it? Um, well, we're looking at planting potatoes after it. Um, basically just, yeah, and, and, and probably going after poppies, poppies slash onions. Um, yeah, as, as a bit of a break before the potatoes. Yep. Is there any specific theory behind that or do you just like the way it roots and the way it puts some biomass in the soil? Uh, it's more the fact that potatoes go in the ground later and if this ends up staying here for another month, I've got time to get the ground ready for the potatoes is probably the most, you know, ideal reason. So harvesting um, this was difficult or with the corn front very very easy? Uh, it's actually really pleasurable with the corn front <laughs> compared to the last couple of years with the conventional front. So how, um, did, how did it go with the conventional front? What were the challenges there? Uh, with the conventional front you're chopping it down and taking the entire crop um, and trying to get it to feed in properly can be really hard uh, but with a corn front the corn front actually processes the bulk of the material before it even enters the machine so basically the whole stalk gets uh, processed and chopped into a fine um, and into about two or three inch lengths and the cobs are too big to go through the the, um, the rollers and they the cobs and some of the leaf drops off and they end up in the machine so you're only processing the cob or the leaf 
Excellent. Um, which makes it exceptionally easy to harvest. So that is a limitation if you don't have a corn front. Uh, absolutely. So what are the greatest limitations of growing maize in Tasmania? And what do you think is the greatest opportunity? Um, I think uh, the biggest challenge is finding the right variety and getting the yield to where it needs to be. Um, corn should be around that you know, $75 a tonne more than wheat. If we can get yields up to around 12 to 15 tonnes of the hectare, it becomes a, a $5,000 hectare, a $5, hectare gross return, which puts it in a very, you know, sort of in between poppies and um, wheat. So it becomes quite a profitable crop. Um, so yeah, so trying to find the right varieties and, and ones that will dry down quicker at the end will be vital. And, and the opportunity is, is huge because it, just, it seems to love to grow pretty well anywhere that we've put it so far. It just, it just seems to love growing and in fact we had a little trial this year uh, that only got watered to help with establishment and after that we actually did dry, like basically ran it dry land and that didn't yield any less than the stuff that was irrigated. So do you think there is an advantage in irrigating it or it, does it depend on the season uh, and how much water we get over summer? Yeah, I think, I think it's something that we're going to have to monitor because irrigating it Left, let it hang on another two to three weeks longer. Um, yet, because we're only after the corn production, not after the actual biomass production like they do with silage, I don't think watering it benefits corn production. Do you think it can tolerate a lot of stress? What are the biggest limitations, uh, agronomically speaking? Uh, if you can get it, I think getting it established is probably the, the hardest thing. Once it gets to about knee high, it'll pretty well take off by itself. Uh, the root ball only comes out 20 centimetres. You can sort of see they've got all these very fine root structure. If you dig down they only come out this far either side. So it's a very narrow root ball but it does go down very deep. So I would say that's why it becomes quite drought tolerant. So there's a really good opportunity to market your maize for the dairy industry in the northwest. If we were going to try doing maize elsewhere in Tasmania where dairy is not so close by what do you think the market opportunities would be? Uh, yeah, well, I know that now that um, Tasmanian stock feed um, at Devonport have now got their um, pelletizer in, they are actually actively looking for corn to put in their rotation because they buy it anyway from the mainland. Um, and I know that uh, XLD have also put a corn price out. Um, so I, I guess there's there's certainly plenty of opportunity, but I would certainly you know, recommend anybody that's close to a dairy farmer, if they can establish the relationship, then you're probably better off. So we've seen that there's some pretty good opportunities with maize here in Tasmania, but so far we need to find the right variety, get it to a short enough season, and then it pretty well does the growing on its own. That's correct. Thanks yeah. for your time today, Michael. Thank you.